Thank you all, panelists. That was terrific. Um, we're going to make our segue now into the next panel as our, uh, as our first guests depart. And I think we're all here in the room, so come on up. Um, we're going to segue now from the uh, issues on the state level to the issues on the national level, and specifically the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, our moderator, Heather Howard, is well known to most of us in this room as the former Commissioner of Health in New Jersey. Uh, her actual title now is as long as some people's bios. She is the director of the State Health Assistance Reform Network, and she's a lecturer at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs at Princeton University. I thought what we would do is jump in actually and talk about Medicaid because the previous panel had a really robust discussion about the exchange and obviously a lot of activity in New Jersey over the last week to do with health insurance exchange and with the insurance uh, reforms in the Affordable Care Act. But what they didn't really talk about was the what I think of as the untold story of the Affordable Care Act, which is the Medicaid expansion. That when you look at the Affordable Care Act, 32 million people nationally will get health insurance under the new law. Half of those uh, newly insured will be under a Medicaid expansion. So a lot of attention in the news about, about insurance exchanges, and those are obviously a very important part of the new law, but the Medicaid expansion is an equally critical part of the new law. So I thought we would jump in there, but I think there's also interest in talking about the Supreme Court case, and so we can talk about that. But So we're, we'll, we'll have a free-flowing uh, dialogue, and then we'll look to, I know many of you in the audience, and know you're not shy. And I should have introduced myself. I'm Heather Howard. I'm now on the faculty at Princeton at the Woodrow Wilson School, and I'm running an initiative of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called the State Health Reform Assistance Network, which is helping states implement the Affordable Care Act. So um, I now bring the perspective of working with a number of other states outside New Jersey. But I'm going to kick it off by, I want to throw it to you, um, Assemblyman Benson, and ask you about the, the Medicaid expansion. So much attention has gone to whether New Jersey is going to set up an exchange and what it's going to look like. but is the Medicaid expansion important for New Jersey? Well, I think it's a really. <coughs> I don't think I need to. Yeah. I think the Medicaid expansion really comes at a crucial time here in New Jersey, and I think there are a lot of things that are coming at the same time here. We have the Medicaid waiver, we have movement of Medicaid uh, uh, enrollees into managed care, and now we have this large influx, over 200,000 potential new enrollees coming in. And the question really comes down to, when the rubber meets the road, can this new managed care system handle that in lots of, uh, of new enrollees? All the changes that are going on with the Medicaid waiver, are they going to make okay. sense? Can everybody hear me now? Uh, much better. One's for the video, one's for everybody else here. Um, so as I was saying, I think the big challenge is going to be, can uh, the new managed care system that we're implementing here for Medicaid and all the changes that are coming out through the waiver process, you know, how does that mesh with the influx of over 200,000 new enrollees that can occur under the Affordable Care Act here in New Jersey? And what does that really mean for providing that care as we go forward? I think uh, Chairman Conaway and then the previous panel talked a lot about, you know, the transitions from um, trying to provide quality services to providing an overall, taking ownership over the patient overall and looking for quality outcomes. And how do we do that and justify that with kind of the managed care system and some of the changes that are happening in the waiver? And I think if we see the managed care system as a way of making sure that there's an overarching system that touches on the, the patient, no matter where they are in the system, that can be a very positive thing. If the managed care system is looking at purely how do we reduce services to save costs, then I think we may end up in some problems. So we got to make sure that there's a balance there between we're looking for cost savings because we are seeing the whole patient's health and having better outcomes, as opposed to looking at it as reducing uh, necessarily perceived overutilization. Not to say that there isn't. I think one of the big importance with the ACO model, with the legislation that's passed and the regulations that are being developed now, um, and the um, nonprofit health organizations in uh, Trenton and Camden and other urban areas that are being developed are going to be key to doing that. So not only will you have the managed care organizations, but you'll have these ACOs, these nonprofit health uh, groups that are sharing information um, to make sure that, one, you don't have overutilization or improper utilization using emergency room care when it should be used uh, through a primary care physician. But all of this means we need more primary care doctors. It means we're going to need more nurses. And it means you know, realigning our system to meet this new demand. And how do we get there? And I think that's, you know, those, that's the devil in the details. Well, Pat, do you want to pick up on that issue about providers? Well, 
of the challenges we have in New Jersey is that we already are short on 1,400 primary care physicians in the state. And we know that there will be a large number of physicians retiring in the next 10 years. Currently, about 56% of all visits to a physician's office is for primary care. Only about 38% of all physicians are in primary care, and only about 8% of all medical students go into primary care. So when you look at that, the numbers don't add up in terms of the number of primary care providers available to handle this large influx of patients. So one of the issues that we're dealing with is looking at the use of advanced practice nurses. And New Jersey has been very much in the forefront of change. In 1991, they did pass legislation allowing advanced practice nurses to practice independently, uh, including prescribing, ordering um, lab tests, uh, doing various things in the office. With the prescription drugs, there is a restriction that they have to have a joint protocol with the physician. Now, this is not supervision. It's not a father may I or mother may I. I can be an APN down in Cape May, and my, my collaborating physician can be up in Warren County. The contract between the two of us may state we meet once a year, we have dinner, um, and you look at one of my patient charts, and that's it. But part of it, it's a collaboration, really, that if I have a question, for example, if I've got a hard-to-treat hypertensive patient, um, I may call anybody. I may call my collaborating physician. I may call a PharmD I know. I may call another APN and say, what do you suggest? But what has happened is, is that collaboration has sometimes become problematic in terms of being able to practice. Some of the managed care companies will not impanel an advanced practice nurse because of the collaborating agreement saying, well, you're supervised by that doctor, and that doctor is not part of our plan. So even though they tried to explain that, no, they're not supervised by that doctor. In fact, the law does state they are not supervised. Because there's that impression, they cannot be part of that plan, which means their patients have to find another provider. So some of the restrictions we have in place may make it difficult to take care of the influx of patients we're expecting under the Affordable Care Act. So part of our concern is removing some of those barriers, which we know aren't needed for safety reasons, because there's, there's a great article from Health Affairs a few years ago about that. There have been numerous other journal articles, peer-reviewed journal articles, talking about the fact that APNs can practice in primary care very safely. And it's not an issue of, of nurses versus doctors, because um, I know like Dr. Scheinbaum is here. I go to his clinic. He employs APNs. There are a lot of physician clinics that are made up of APNs, physicians assistants, and physicians. So it's not an us versus them. It becomes an issue of whether nurses can practice independently, whether there are restrictions in terms of reimbursement, and whether in the future we will have enough of any primary care provider to meet the needs of the public. So Steve, you, you've worked with a lot of states on waivers. Can you shed any light on New Jersey's waiver and how that will impact this Medicaid expansion? Well, I, I, I would add uh, a couple of points. One, the, um, there, the states across the country, not just New Jersey, are, are facing the Medicaid agencies are, are dealing with a lot of issues, not just, uh, not just the expansion that's uh, looming ahead. And one of them is waiver, the waiver. And, and some, there are a number of states that have gone for fairly comprehensive waivers. And New Jersey is obviously in the midst of uh, uh, that process with uh, CMS, which is a process that is necessarily kind of tightly held. It's a bit of a chess match with, uh, with the feds to get it done right. And so, but we, we anticipate, uh, uh, I anticipate working uh, somewhat with Valerie Haar, the Medicaid director, and others just uh, on the side on other issues that this is, it's gonna move forward and, and happen. And there's some very interesting things in the waiver around behavioral health and uh, long-term care, which I think we'll probably talk about a little bit more before we're done. But <clears throat> I wanted to go back to the expansion, uh, pop, the expansion issue just briefly as well. Uh, the, Heather characterized it as a little bit of a sleeper issue in the whole ACA debate that's going on uh, with the Supreme Court and the elections, et cetera. But it's, uh, it's a very big sleeper issue. It's a sleeper issue that is going to have enormous impact in, in a number of states, particularly those in the south with, uh, with low 
um, coverage of uh, lo low-income people. So that New Jersey, where it's, I, I think, uh, Assemblyman, you, me you mentioned over 200,000. It's going to be over 200,000. I've seen estimates up to 400,000. There are going to be a lot of newly eligible people for Medicaid in the state of New Jersey. And underneath that, with that issue, there are, there are things that need to be considered and figured out, like uh, how are you going to determine eligibility and how you're going to enroll them, what kind of outreach. So there was some discussion of that in the earlier session. Um, there's, there are issues around benefits and benefit design. And Heather, you're, you've worked with a number of states that are further down the road in thinking about this, so you could speak to, speak to that issue. But one of the other issues that's kind of a sleeper here is what's the population look like, this, this bench, excuse me, this expansion population. And there were estimates early on and debates back and forth with Urban Institute and others about the degree to which the population would have serious, uh, complex conditions or would be very healthy or relatively healthy. And the, the debate isn't resolved. There are national data out there. There's some work uh, in some states to try and get a better grip on it. But this has implications for the delivery system and for access, not just to primary care, but uh, in particular, if you think of the population as having high degrees of behavioral health issues, substance abuse issues, mental health, uh, a number of them are cycling in and out of jails, so you have the corrections issues and the connections there. You have to think about a different delivery system, not just a primary care delivery system, but a, a system that can deal with behavioral health issues, substance abuse issues, and developing the, the treatment capacity on the ground for those. And no state is jumping out and getting way ahead on that, uh, so New Jersey isn't behind, but New Jersey is not except in, insofar as they're thinking about it in, or anticipating it with respect to the waiver changes they're making. Um, that's something to, to be thinking about a lot as well. So um, the expansion population and the expansion issue may be a sleeper, but it's a sleeper that's going to come rolling at us. Um, 2014 is not all that far away. January 1st, 2014 is not all that far away anymore. And uh, we can get back to Heather, the Supreme Court issue, and, and say, well, is the, is the Medicaid expansion going to stand? You could do a, everybody, we could ask them to vote with their, you know, raise their hands. 92% will say, yes, it's going to stand. Whatever the number is, that's more likely to happen than most other parts of the legislation, and it's something we, we do have to prepare for. So Steve's right. With the Supreme Court um, for, for debate on four questions. One of them, again, got less attention, and the speaker issue was the constitutionality of Medicaid expansion. But um, most court watchers agree that that's the least likely to go return. So, of course, I hear the takeaway is you've got a lot of that talk about the exchange, but the Medicaid expansion is likely to stay and it's going to have great impacts in New Jersey. And as you said, it has a greater impact than in other states that have less robust Medicaid programs, but it's still a big impact in New Jersey. So, and, and even though we have great coverage of children and parents, we do not have this has definitely been on our minds as legislators. I think a lot of stakeholders kind of feel that while a lot of work is going into the waiver process through the administration, that there really hasn't been, and there's been a lot of input in, there really hasn't been a lot of information coming out. Um, and that kind of black box kind of discussion, I think, has been frustrating, at least for some legislators and also for a number of stakeholders that I think are eager to understand what's going to happen with the waiver and how does that going to impact especially after the Supreme Court case, and I agree with you. I think as long as the severability issue is, is decided that they're not throwing out the whole thing because of something being unconstitutional, that the Medicaid waiver, I mean, Medicaid expansion is the piece that is the easiest to stay. The only way that that would get is, uh, again, if the Supreme Court decided Medicaid in itself was unconstitutional, which is unlikely at this point. Um, so assuming that the Medicaid expansion is coming, assuming that some form of the waiver will survive coming through and be approved by the Obama administration. Um, how do we reconcile both of those happening at the same time? And are there things we can do now to identify that population? Uh, as uh, was mentioned, 
you know, can we start doing some, you know, working with different groups uh, like our FQHCs, like our ACOs, to understand that population, whether it's a healthy population, what's that population mix, um, how, what is their current utilization looking like, what, and will it change just because they have Medicaid? You know, if you have folks that are now that are now using the emergency room, just because they get Medicaid doesn't mean they're going to stop. If that's the place where they know to go, and there isn't that outreach, um, and you know, there's a lot of questions going on now about enrolling people that are eligible for Medicaid now where we feel the outreach may not be occurring where it needs to be. And a lot of uh, the um, F, uh, FQHCs have been doing a lot of great work in that when they come in, they see somebody eligible, they'll have somebody on site to help enroll. The question is now we get to this largest group that may have never been to an FQHC or to a clinic or to some other place. How do we get them enrolled and what are the processes that we do? And is there a transition from some of the family care that we're doing where we're going to be transitioning them now that they're eligible into the, the Medicaid expansion? Are they, are, do we have people moving into that? And again, how do we discuss how to be a proper consumer with insurance? And I think there's a lot of education efforts that we're going to have to do and that we're going to have to talk about. And again, the more we know about the, the, the waiver and where it may end up now, the earlier the legislature can work on some of these efforts with the administration to make sure we have the structures in place uh, to be where we need to be in the future. Talk a little more about the waiver, <clears throat> Okay, yeah. So, um, and the two pieces of the waiver that I'm most familiar with, and, and I think, Pat, you've been involved in one of them, is the on the long-term care side, and the other one is around behavioral health issues. And um, <clears throat> I would say, again, uh, stepping back and, and thinking nationally, uh, there is, among states across the country and at the federal level in CMS, a, a, a very uh, strong interest in creating more integrated, integrated systems of care for the, these kinds of beneficiaries, those that need multiple kinds of uh, services, physical health and behavioral health, or physical health, uh, behavioral health and substance, mental health and substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And so there's a push toward integration, there's a push toward uh, greater accountability and away from fee-for-service. So what's going on in New Jersey with the behavioral health and with the managed long-term care concept? The, New Jersey is uh, somewhere in the middle of the pack in terms of moving forward on these issues. There are states, and actually New Jersey, uh, that several people from New Jersey went down and visited Tennessee. In Tennessee, there are health plans which are responsible for physical health behavioral health and long-term care. It's all capitated within the three or four health plans that operate in Tennessee. So that's something that Tennessee may be out on the front edge here a little bit, but that's what's happening more and more in states across the country. So New Jersey and moving toward on the long-term care side, manage long-term care and linkages with the physical health side, that's a direction that other states are going in to try and integrate care to reduce duplication, get away from the fragmentation that people face out in the system. And uh, I think that uh, there, are, there are a number of reasons why all this is being wrapped up into the waiver and I don't have, uh, I don't have the inside scoop on all that, but it certainly is in keeping with trends nationally. Yeah, okay. One thing I want to touch on is one of the dangers that was mentioned during the earlier panel, which is TenCare as an example. Um, TenCare started out with having many managed care organizations and wound up with primarily one. And the problem at that point was that there was no very little negotiations going on between the state or the various uh, beneficiaries and TenCare. That one managed care corporation ran it. And which really meant some of the protections that we want to put in place were, were no longer there. So I think that's something we have to be very careful about with having, I think Ward mentioned, four or five major players in the state, is that we don't end up with consolidation to the point where there's one plan, take it or leave it. Because Tank here basically has backed off of a lot of what they had done historically because of the fact that the quality of care was no longer there. So that's something I think we have to keep our eyes on. And one of the challenges with Medicaid is that a number of providers don't take Medicaid. They don't take Medicaid because the fees are very low. And while we're expanding this huge base, if we don't also keep an eye on whether those providers are continuing to take patients, access will not be there. So I think that's one of the other challenges we have with this transition. 
Yeah, no, I was just also going to add, I, you know, with the, the rising cost of long-term care and that kind of explosion, mm -hmm. and it's the, the fastest, I think, cost, rising cost in, medic, in the Medicaid population. Uh, like you said, access of care is going to be so critical. Um, reimbursement uh, rates are so key for doctors, especially as these costs are rising at such a, a, a fast rate. And utilization of care, uh, end-of-life decisions, and the discussions that primary care physicians are having uh, with their patients, New Jersey has a very uh, large uh, a senior population, and it's growing. Um, so these are issues that need to be discussed now um, because it's only going to grow at a much faster rate over the next couple of years. Um, and we want to make sure that the whole process of expand Medicaid expansion and a Medicaid waiver, we want to make sure the wheels don't fall off the bus because of one aspect of it is not being watched and, and managed carefully. And so um, I think that's key. There is some good news on the horizon. It's on. There's some good news on the horizon that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. But last week, the administration, the Obama administration, released rules on how they're going to do other basis that is called primary care bump up. seven states uh, that are kind of at the cutting edge of thinking about the primary care bump and how to implement it. It's very complicated. I'm not even trying to, to explain how they do the calculations based on rates paid July 1st of 2009 or something along those lines. It's quite complicated. And, uh, but, and it is, as Heather said, just a two-year bump. It's just authorized in two years. It's worth $8 billion nationally. New Jersey will be, uh, again, as Heather said, a, a beneficiary of this. The money passes through the health plans to the primary care docs. All that needs to be worked out. Um, and while it's being done, it's important for the state and for the other stakeholders that anticipate a desire to continue to keep the rate to that level to try and uh, demonstrate or calculate or show in some fashion what impact this has had, what impact it has had in terms of increasing access to primary care providers, uh, physicians, or nurse practitioners, what access, what uh, impact it has had in terms of reducing hospitalizations and ER use, because the thinking behind this bump is that we need more primary care docs because we have more people that are going to be covered, and we need more primary care docs because if people have access to good primary care, they won't go to the emergency room, they won't have untreated illnesses that, that require them to go to the emergency room and stay in hospital. So that argument needs to be carried out and studied as the primary care bump is uh, implemented. And there is a, there's an official term for it that's not the primary care bump, but we'll work on getting it. <laughs> I want to open up, I'm going to throw one last question to the panel, maybe we can that morning and we're going to open up the questions. Yeah, 
Affordable Care Act itself will make us healthier. I think that there are a number of initiatives that we've been undertaking in New Jersey to try to look at some of those issues. Among those is the, the ACO model, the bill that was passed last year, which takes a look at how do you care from being crisis mode in the emergency room and moving it into the community, into primary care. I think this is a, a struggle we've had for a while. So I don't think the Affordable Care Act alone does it. I think it helps in providing some money and some structure and some incentive to look at what we're doing. It's going to force us to take a look at our healthcare system. Um, will the end result be that people will be healthier and happier and less cost to hospitals? We hope. I think it's going to be a huge education process. I think we forget that people in some parts of the state have never had a primary care provider. The emergency room is their primary care provider. A friend of mine, her son is, is um, a resident. He's working in emergency room at UMDNJ. Somebody showed up at 2 a.m. and the doctor so watched emergency room. He said, well, I'm here for my checkup. <laughs> I always come here for my annual checkup. To take that population and to educate them as to how to use a new health care system, I don't think is something we should underestimate. And I think this is a real opportunity for groups in the community, whether it's church-based groups or advocacy groups or AARP, you name it, to really start creating an education process for people for how do you use a health care system you've never had access to. If we don't do that, I think we will still be experiencing some of these same struggles. So I think we really need to focus on that basic education and outreach and maybe using lay health care people to get the word out, uh, like promotoras in Texas who go out in the community or part of that community talk about, you need to go see the doctor. These are the questions you should ask. We should really start thinking about helping p educate people. Yeah. I think the Affordable Care Act, what well, does two things. I mean, I think a lot of the changes, as, as you just said, that there's a change in the marketplace and there's a change in, in recognition of the system that things have to change and that's happening already through the ACO model, making sure super users that, you know, we had one person I think in, in Trenton or Camden that was four, more than 400 visits in one year, which means that on the same day they went to multiple emergency rooms uh, or multiple hospitals for service. So using those type of models, using the concept of a medical home to make sure we're looking at the overall total care. Um, those types of models are happening now because the marketplace demands it and currently insured, whether through Medicaid or otherwise, are demanding those changes to make things healthier. And so I think we'll see a lot of healthier outcomes. For that other population, the uninsured, I think the Affordable Care Act can have a huge impact if we do it right. Because literally we're living in two different health systems, those that are insured and those that aren't. And I think we are, because of the changes in the system, we're going to see healthier outcomes for those that are insured already. What the Affordable Care Act has the potential to do is those on the uninsured are ready to see healthy in, uh, improvements, even if the system didn't change by having insurance. But now on top of that, almost like a greenfield build, uh, we talk in energy and other areas, to have them leapfrog from being not only from being uninsured to insured, but being from uninsured to a healthy care model. So I think there's a, a, a much larger savings potential there. And I think the, American, uh, the Affordable Care Act really helps not only to provide additional money, but removes a lot of the barriers that occur th by not having insurance. My biggest concern in New Jersey is twofold, besides long -term care act, the long-term care issue, is that we still are going to have uninsured people. This does not cover everybody. And we know what populations aren't going to be covered. And that's why the ACO models and these other models are so important. And I think the other area is um, dealing with um, making sure that states and as the, the reimbursement rates in our hospitals, if we're talking about using hospitals less, we just built three new hospitals, uh, three new hospitals are just opened in the last month, I, I'd say, mm -hmm. Virtua, Capital Health, and Princeton mm -hmm. at Plainsboro, I must uh, add that, since it's in my district. Um, and, and I think there's a fourth one as well um, that just opened or is about to open. But if we're saying we've got to move to a model where we're using hospitals less and hospitals less and hospitals less, we already have hospitals that are being sold to for-profit systems. There's a lot of shakeup that's going to happen, even more so in the hospital area. We really need to be working on this now and what that means 
and how do we allow movement from the emergency room into, there's a lot of federal rules that you know you can't do, once they get into the emergency room, you can't do anything about it, um, even if they do come in for an annual checkup. And it, so there's a lot of things that we have to do before they even walk in that door to make sure that we are not, um, that we're working with our hospitals to make sure that care comes in and bringing in the other care uh, potentials to make sure that it all works together. Because um, the last thing we want to see is, again, more hospitals failing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and on that point, that the law assumes a dramatic cut in dish funding and reimbursement for hospitals because it assumes that they'll be seeing insurer patients, but there's a question of timing. Will those happen at the same time, or will there be a gap? And is that going to cause greater hospital stress? So, so very, very important issues. So let's open it up. I'm sure we've got questions. Please. Hi, my name is Andrea Norberg, and I'm a nursing executive from UMD and J School of Nursing. I actually um, have been working on a project that's federally funded uh, to work with Ryan White uh, clinics throughout the U.S. to become certified as patient-centered medical homes. And so I guess I'd like to hear a little more about what's going on in our state around incentives to become a PCMH, um, thoughts about nurses' roles within a PCMH, state demonstration projects, that sort of thing. Well, I, I, I was, I was going to pick up on the assemblyman's remarks. There's a lot in the legislation about patient-centered medical homes and health homes, uh, which is in keeping with what I was talking about earlier, the integrated care approach. These are all elements of integrated care. I don't know specifically what's going on in New Jersey with respect to patient-centered medical home, but there are a number of states that are pushing that very hard. Uh, and again, with respect to Ryan White and AIDS, um, HIV and AIDS, I, I would imagine that that's a perfect place for that kind of more integrated approach to take to to occur and to have teams that that include uh, doctors and nurses and social workers and others. And so. I, I, I would think it's very much in keeping. What the state is specifically doing on that issue right now, I'm not, I, I, I'm not aware of yet. I'll just add to that that Ryan White is the payer of last resort. So most of the patients are moving to state Medicaid systems. And so the enhanced reimbursement that Ryan White has provided will likely go away. And so these patients will be cared for under the state Medicaid systems. And the integrated services that are under Ryan White, frankly, are not going to exist under state Medicaid unless there's some incentives that go along with that. Yeah, I think that uh, when, and we should talk about uh, being a good purchaser, and the Medicaid agency has to be a good purchaser and has to recognize the population that it's dealing with. That's part of what I was talking about earlier in terms of, of uh, the subset of the expansion population that's going to have complex illnesses. You can't just turn them loose out there. You need, uh, in some instances, instances, to develop health homes or patients in medical homes with slightly higher rates uh, because based on risk and uh, risk adjustment, so that you can create um, uh, incentive for providers to come together to serve the population the way uh, they have been served or they should be served uh, going forward. So I, I, I hear what you're saying. Ryan White is such a unique area. I mean, one of the challenges is that someone who has HIV AIDS has multiple, multiple issues. And having the expertise, I would hate to lose. I know under the Affordable Care Act, many of the medical home models are based on being run by APNs or by physicians. In New Jersey, we, we have, we have the, the, the issue with the joint protocol, but it's still doable to have an APN run a clinic. Um, in terms of trying to preserve, I'm not sure what what the issues are in New Jersey specifically that may impact your ability to remain as an entity. Because that sounds like that's part of your. I would hate to. <laughs> I, would, I would hate to have your group lose because the expertise you've developed over the last 20 years is one that I think has enabled us to move from HIV AIDS being a death sentence to really chronic disease, which, which has some very unique issues. 
and to simply mainstream people into most other doctor's offices I think would be a challenge because I don't think those offices necessarily have all that expertise. So I would love to explore, maybe, maybe this is a legislative issue, maybe it's something we can work on, but I would love to explore with you, maybe with these yeah, other I was gonna say, I'd make the offer, but we'd be happy to sit down in the legislature talk more about that. One of the big things that we're looking at in the legislature is where are the gaps that we created here as we do a transition, because we know they're gonna be there. Where are the gaps gonna happen because of the waiver? Because uh, we don't know, again, what's gonna improve, what's not, some areas we don't know as much as we want to. And we know as in any transition there are gaps. We've got to make sure we build in enough flexibility in the system. And because of the veto and um, we get come full circle, we know we're getting another bite of the apple. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussions going on with the chairman um, and with the legislature on what does the second bite look like. And a lot of that would happen prior to even passing the first version. And a lot of those changes didn't get into the first version with the anticipation that there might be the future. So, but the question is, can we, you know, after the Supreme Court decision, turn quickly enough uh, to get all of that uh, stakeholder input implemented so we don't have as many gaps as, as could occur? Uh, but I would just say on the on the mental point, concept, a number of the FQACs, I know one uh, just joined the board for NHA Austin Center, they've been using medical team models, even though it's not necessarily mental home name. They are building up that level of quality so that they can meet what that term is from a national standpoint of quality. And they are building their model on that, and especially, you know, HIV is an area that they're, they're trying to serve. Just like on the behavioral health side, you know, that ACO model, that sharing of information, I'm going to pull, put a plug in for digitized records, how important that is going to be in this model to share from one place to the other, and being able through the ACO to share information for those. Um, users that have to enter in so many places to make sure that we reduce medical mistakes and make sure that they aren't lost in the shuffle. You know, there's a lot of work to be, to be done, and some days it seems exhausting. But the legislature wants to be that partnership to make sure that now that, you know, after the Supreme Court case is done, and our hope that it is a positive outcome, we can move with as quickly as the as government can to, to meet so these. One week, exactly. One week between the Supreme Court and I actually have two comments, but I'll, I'll roll them into one. Um, Kathy Brett Davis, I'm with New Jersey Primary Care Association. I represent the FQHCs here in the state of New Jersey. A um, couple of things that I think we all need to think about. I think we're all thinking that if we get a card, it equates to access. And what we're finding is that even with a card, we can't find specialists. We can't find child psychiatrists. So our networks here in New Jersey are still suspect. We have to find a way, not only with primary care, but also to get specialty and other wraparound services in this model. Because without that, I'm a functional diabetic. I need an endocrinologist. It can't stop at just my primary care provider. And that's where we're, where I think, somewhat suspect in this model. And the other thing I wanted to mention, and the assemblyman took the thought right out of my, my uh, mouth, was the technology component. Many of the FQHCs, all of them actually, have an EMR system. We can't connect. None of us are connectable, not to the hospitals, not to the specialists, not to mental health providers. And I think unless we can somehow bring that together, and I see Bill Burns sitting in the, the audience who works with high tech, that's an extremely important component of the American, of the ACA, that we have to have technology that speaks to each other because we're all still then working in silos and nothing's been accomplished. I, I just want to add, not only is it the, the I think my back's working fine now, uh, it's not only just the endocrinologist other specialty with primary care, but we have to remember, and I, I, I see some of my friends in the pharmacy community, our pharmacists are the ones that see, especially when my mother's a diabetic. I mean, it's her pharmacist that really had that interaction, even more so than the primary care physician. Um, that's a call to a nurse to reward, you know, to talk about to reward the medicine most more often than not. And then it's the pharmacist that she interacts with who asks, you know, how are you doing with your diabetes? You know, have we noticed been testing your blood more often? Is that because you're eating differently or anything else? that conversation. So how do we tie in even pieces that can't be a part of the home model? Um, we really need to work with every single part uh, of that system. And so uh, you know, I think that's a key, key component to talk about. Well, agreed.
great conversation. We didn't get to talk about the Supreme Court, but maybe should we poll the audience? Yeah, yeah. yeah. or let's poll the panel, please. Is the entire audience going to be upheld? Anybody vote for that? I, I think everything. <laughs> That's my vote. Well, That's my vote. Right, so. uh, the mandate is obviously the part that I think. Yeah, uh, right. Everybody watch. It'll be a very tortured decision if they do strike down. I participated in a discussion yesterday with some constitutional scholars, and the takeaway was that there, there may be five votes to repeal the mandate, but what you do after you do that is so complicated that you start to tease out what you do with the rest of the law, and maybe some of you want to do. So the court may be struggling with that now, right? And of course, the court is working on the decision right now, but everyone seems, seems to think that last week in June, so that was not to you. We know that's a busy time to try to uh, ready for that. But I think I think we're um, we're getting the plug, but we'll hang around. Oh, it's breathless. I think I think Becky. Carolyn Bellacini, the Unitarian. No, we're not going. We have to move on to the next panel, but we'll hang around.